I first met Dan when he was a graduate student. He came to Tufts to teach, and he was teaching English one, I guess just to keep life and limb together while he was finishing his presentation with uh, Arthur Danto. And uh, he came around the philosophy department, I think I was chair at the time, and said, well, uh, philosophy one also passes the writing requirements. Any chance I could switch over to the philosophy department and teach sections of philosophy one instead of English one? And it was very clear from talking with him that that would be a great idea. So he was actually our colleague in the philosophy department for one year or two. One and a half, something like that. And that was way back in the early 80s or late 70s. Yeah. And uh, he's published a novel. He's a multi-talented renaissance man. And I'm looking forward to hear what he has to say. Well, thank you. Um, Yes, uh, so it was, I'm a philosopher, I'm in the career because of that interchange, that little change of roles that Dan just mentioned, and so um, it's a, a wonderful uh, starting point uh, for me. What you used to do was invite, um, when there's a book that you were particularly interested in grappling with, you made it open to students to come and join you in a kind of independent study in that, and I was, and you invited me to sit in on those uh, small meetings. And, um, and so um, Knowledge in the Flow of Information was one of those books, as was uh, Gibson's Ecological Approach to Visual Perceptions. So that was a great way to hit some of the classics of the field. Um, Dan invited me to, um, to pre present a half-baked idea. Uh, I took that request very, very seriously. And it wasn't particularly hard for me because most of my ideas fall in that category. <laughs> and so, the half-baked one I have for you today involves relating the global function of the brain um, to the functional dynamics of music. Um, and, uh, and I hope that by presenting it in a couple of different aspects, a couple of different lights, I can reheat the oven. I don't think I can expect to do much more than that with this today. I'd like to talk about this hypothesis first by situating it with respect to cognitive science overall, and then uh, talk about empirical approaches, uh, conceptual ways of thinking about it, a practical application, and finally an aesthetic uh, sense of it. So let's suppose that you get out your handy smartphone and on a given day you're a little bored and you want to actually discover how the thing works. You're not content with what happens when you punch the buttons. You want to find out what's going on inside. So you grab your toolbox and begin a, a succession of different ways in. You start with your table saw and see what you can find out that way. Get a little more organized with your um, screwdriver and pliers, and then you find yourself needing to revert to your tweezers, and then you're looking through a microscope, and eventually you end up looking through an electron microscope in order to find out what's really happening. And a decade later, or maybe more, um, you feel like you've accomplished your goal, and now you know how your smartphone works. And so you say, on the one hand, you began with a very high level uh, knowledge of the operation of your phone. You knew what happened when you poked it. And you end up after this long term of study, a low level understanding, but a very detailed understanding of the bits, the widgets that add up to make the phone. Um, arguably, our situation in neuroscience is somewhat like this situation in that there's a tremendous amount of understanding of the widgets. Um, a lot more to know, of course. Um, and there's an understanding of the, of the way widgets connect in the sense of tracks that connect things. And so the Connectome Project, the uh, analog of the Genome Project, is an effort to uh, log thousands of brains in an effort to determine the connectivity pattern that we see on screen. So neuroscience is sort of in the situation of who as the intrepid iPhone or uh, smartphone explorer. There is, on the one hand, an understanding of behavior, and that's what psychology uh, is in the business of doing. And at the lower level, then, there is an understanding through various, many fields of neuroscience of different aspects of, we might say, the connectivity. Going back, though, to the smartphone, if we think about the situation you'd be in with this complete understanding of how the neurons flow, between that level and the understanding or the explanation of the system behavior that you were initially interested in is this vast gulf. It would take you years to give the low-level explanation of a single pixel on There's so much complexity and so much going on there. Some kind of middle-level 
bridge between the two is required. And of course, in the case of the phone, there's no question about this. There are hierarchies of computer languages, programming languages, which provide that bridge. At the lowest level, the machine language is actually telling electrons what to do. And uh, registers are changing state, and all of this is happening at a very basic level. And, uh, and that's the basis for building higher and higher level languages all the way up to the apps. And so in the world of computers, of course, there are mid-levels. Computers began at that level of analysis and did not exist any other way. So that has given rise in cognitive science to a comparable argument for exactly the same conclusion uh, with respect to the mind. And this is um, locus classicus, I guess, is uh, Jerry Fodor's uh, language of thought, uh, now 40 years old, I notice, um, and which posits the inner code, um, the programming language, but in any case, the medium in which, uh, in which the computation of the brain is conducted, called mentalese. Now situate my half-baked thought, which is to go in another direction entirely from that hypothesis uh, towards an idea that instead of thinking of this in terms of language, we think of it in terms of music. Um, so we will call this the music of thought we, um, hypothesis, that the code is a musical code, uh, more music-like than, um, than it is language-like. How to get at this, first of all, empirically? Well, out in Alpha Centauri, as well as many other star systems, they're receiving signals from us all the time. And so they must be mystified by these uh, projections uh, that are now out about 110 light years. Um, so there's probably plenty of planets that are in a position, at least, to listen to Fox News. And so they're probably wondering what's going on, if they could even get that far. From their point of view, there's no way of interpreting what's coming across their, uh, their antennas. Um, they can only look at the symbols. They can't connect symbols to objects because that's four light years away to know that the word table refers to table. And so they can only look at properties of the sequence of symbols. And so they have some way of carving up that sequence. Uh, they decide that each, what the chunks are that they are, are, are collecting. What can they do? Well, they could count up the discrete symbols and find out how many of them uh, there are of each symbol type that they might identify. Um, and so one thing they might do out there is if they had access to Wikipedia, um, so they have Wi-Fi, we assume, um, but have no other idea of what's going on, is they could count the occurrence of words. And, um, and they would find, looking at, at uh, Wikipedia at least, that the most um, popular word is certainly the word the, uh, which actually accounts uh, for almost 6% of our, of our language production. So we could save ourselves that much time by eliminating the word, word the. Um, and uh, the second most popular word is, uh, is approximately half as, um, as frequent. Its rate of occurrence, or its total number of occurrences, is half as much as the word of. The third word, the third most popular word, is one third as frequent as the most popular. The fourth most popular word is one fourth as frequent as the most popular, and the fifth most popular word is one fifth, and so on. The one, the five hundredth most popular word, is uh, is one five hundred of the popularity or the occurrence of the first one. This is an extremely regular relationship, a mathematically well described sort of curve. Um, it's a power law, and to us um, uh, as Ziff's law. Um, and it is approximately the, the statement that the frequency of the occurrence of a word, or many other things as it happens, is inversely proportionate to the rank if you do a ranking of all the popularities of the word. True of English in spoken forms, and also true of, uh, I believe, every language that has been studied, including programming languages and undeciphered ancient languages. They're, they just count up the marks that they're able to discriminate. And it follows Ziff's law. So here's a feature of language, human language, which is very general. And the Alpha Centaurians might stumble across this. The question is, could they use this to raise the question of what kind of signal that they're listening to? And that's the question of whether you could discriminate using the conformity to Ziff's law between symbol streams that happen to be linguistic and symbol streams that happen to be musical. So the first empirical approach to this 
that I've taken is to, is to check that one up, uh, creating, um, using uh, database samples of large swaths of, uh, of uh, seven different languages. And then melodies, uh, monophonic uh, melodies um, that are also available online from various musical traditions in order to compare them in their ziffiness, how close they come to the ideal ziff distribution. And this is simply a, a, a matter of, of, of looking at the difference between the two curves, the observed curve and then what the ideal would be for that uh, number of uh, symbols. And um, on the graph up in front of you, we see that language is very self-similar and is quite similar. That is, zero here is perfectly ziffy. Um, and language is quite close to that in my, in my subset of languages. Music, on the other hand, is widely distributed and its centers are away from perfect ziffiness, the zero here. So on these charts, then, there's the mean. Uh, the solid bar is box plot. The solid bar is uh, 25th to the 76th percentile. And the triangles are the 95% confidence interval. So if the ties overlap, then we have two things that are not statistically different from each other. OK, so now there's potentially an empirical test of uninterpreted symbol streams that distinguishes music and language. So now we turn to the brain. And um, Nancy set this up beautifully in, in terms of introducing us to both uh, fMRI and independent component analysis. So um, the one analogy to understand what ICA does is the following. Let's suppose you're all members of a choir, and so we've got the sopranos and the altos and the basses, but you're not sitting in your sections. You are sitting all dispersed around the room, and I want to know where the sopranos are. And all I have is a recording, a stereo recording of the Hallelujah Chorus sung by all of them. Independent component analysis enables us to find the components, uh, to find the sopranos wherever they're sitting. Um, it locates and the other sections as well. In fact, it doesn't begin by assuming anything about sopranos, altos, or basses. Now, one way to understand how we might use this then is through this animation, which I, I know is slightly dim, but I think you'll be able to see. If, we, if these are independent components, uh, they aren't the sopranos, altos, and tenors, but you get the idea, that are activating on different time courses, different time periods, um, as time passes in a single brain. And so it's as if, these are all happening simultaneously, overlapping regions, but we've statistically separated them out. We've, in a sense, identified the teams that are playing together, that are uh, all playing together. And so these can, independent components can take um, many different forms, including um, artifacts, the eyeballs, which we eliminate from our analysis, um, sometimes occupying multiple regions, and sometimes being fairly isolated in their uh, physical location. Can we take this kind of parsing of the brain and convert it into a symbol stream like the other symbol streams in our study? The method used here, then, is simply to take the varying activity levels of each of these regions, their numbers in their original form in any case, and as we go through, just finding the hot spot, the region, the independent component which is most active at a given moment. And so if it's at the first moment, um, area two, whatever that is, is most active, we'll just symbolize that. The next two are area five, and so forth. And so we reduce uh, input um, into a stream of monophonic or singleton symbols. And that enables us then to present, to put together brain, music, and language in a single measure. I use 99 brains here. Um, um, and the most were brains at rest, a rest state uh, um, functional MRI, also known as the default mode, or that's the condition of those brains. The rest of the, um, of the set was to, um, split between patients with schizophrenia and healthy control subjects doing a simple button push, uh, sorry, button pressing task. Um, and so there is a separation here, and the group results are kind of down near the bottom. Yes, they don't completely overlap, but the takeaway is that music and brain activity is different from language. Um, and so in this way of interpreting things, there's an empirical 
um, setting that, uh, that distinguishes the groups. We can go on from here to talk about what we might call second order analysis, which is where we take pairs of each of these symbol streams, word pairs, note pairs, and brain state pairs, hotspot pairs, and subject them to exactly the same analysis. And now we're beginning to make the transition towards a sort of a grammatical constraints. What's allowed to be after what? Um, and how, how permissive is that? And there, too, at the second order now, looking at pairs in this form of analysis, there continues to remain, but the space between them is getting much smaller at this point. I introduced this briefly, though, to be able to then relate these two dimensions of analysis to create a landscape, a Ziffian landscape, of the domains of language, music, and brain activity um, so interpreted. Language all collected down here, very near the perfect Ziffianness of the origin. The brain areas uh, fairly closely collected in this region, but music all over the place. And so, um, so as we zoom in on this, we can see a little more of the fine structure. We see how the languages are all at this corner. But I do want to point out one brain. This is my hundredth brain in the analysis, um, which was not, unlike all the others, uh, loaned data. This is the experiment I ran myself. This is the brain of our esteemed host, Dan Dennett, um, located amidst all the other brains, um, and not terribly far off, although the conditions of the experiment were actually quite different. But it was a rest state, uh, five minutes of, of rest. And so there he is um, uh, among all these others. Having a single analysis of music, text, and brain enables us to do something a little unusual, which is we can look at what works of music are most similar in their Ziffian structure to Dan Dennett's brain. And so we can go in here and discover that the single piece of music which lands closest is this one, George Gershwin's National Nightingale. <laughs> So this gives some new meaning to their playing our song. Um, so they're playing your song. OK, let me move to the conceptual dimension of this discussion. Um, arguably, the two very fuzzy regions of language and music overlap, um, or or not. I think that, that there, it, it, there are commonalities between the two. There are also some fairly large distinctions. Um, and I think that that suggests, and now we've imaging uh, data that supports this, that we're dealing with very separate cognitive capacities and very separate sorts of systems. The question is whether the music system, the musical way of thinking, as a global approach to cognition, uh, fits with other conceptualizations we might have on perception and motor behavior and consciousness itself. So here's a um, graphic, uh, graphic philosopher, Nick Susanis, uh, depiction of the Mona Lisa to remind us that we never see the whole Mona Lisa. We only take little snippets of it, fixation points <laughs> reveal small bits of information. What he's done graphically is to kind of take us on a little tour of fixations from eye to the other eye. And we also see the saccadic movement. He's adapted this from uh, Jarvis's classic study. Um, and how we look up at her, her uh, eyebrow and then we cross down to her nose and so forth. And he elaborates this as a kind of film strip of successive fixations of the Mona Lisa to get this image. I put this up there just because uh, if you take a look across the, um, across the individual images of the fixations, the question is whether this is a structure that more resembles the form we're used to in musical scripts, in musical scores, or the form we're used to in language. And by virtue of its repetition, its rhythmic structure, and so forth, it has something in common with music. It's a theme in variations. Um, thinking about the movements of eating lunch, we see the same movements repeated and varied. Different ways of then parsing the, uh, the actions of our bodies and perception. Briefly then, um, as we look through the st what we are trying to understand when we are trying to understand perception, we talk about objects and events um, in which we use our abilities to 
repeat or retake information to modify themes and variations. We build from there to create, construct scenes or our, our conception of process. Uh, moving on from there to, um, to abstractly interpret what we're seeing. Um, and at each of these stages, there is a musical concept which, which um, in its own domain, um, addresses that very issue. The takeaway then being that there's a set of terminology already in play here and a field of cognitive musicology which might be usefully um, applied at a global level. But the main thing is that it is a temporal form and perception is, and consciousness are highly temporal. We cannot, we cannot cognize, we cannot uh, think without having a continual awareness of what's about to happen and what has just happened. To understand that as a form, we already have music. Switching then quickly to, um, to the practical applications, we could take global brain dynamics and do what's called sonification, the, equivalent, the sound equivalent of visualization, and among other things, distinguish between brains in different conditions, in this case between healthy uh, subjects and schizophrenia patients, and without playing any of these samples, um, uh, in the interest of time, um, you can see by the spectrograms that we're looking at a very different uh, succession of, of rhythms and a different structure of, uh, of frequencies, the higher frequencies being patients. Without any other training, with a very little bit of training, a couple examples, um, folks and audiences are able to recognize unlabeled um, sound tracks, brain tracks, uh, at a pretty high rate of accuracy, 70% and above. So that's a potential practical application. But, uh, but now to step back even a little further from this. You might be thinking, oh, that's ridiculous. How could a cultural artifact, which is music, possibly then be infiltrated into an entire brain process? But what I'd like to suggest is that question has it backwards. The question is, if global brain processes, as I've could it, in turn, influence the cultural production of music by virtue of a kind of resonance, a recognition that musical productions are representing a flow of thought, but not with words. Um, and so uh, I learned earlier today, it was great from, from David, that uh, the etymology of organ traces back to the instrument, the organ. And so I could say the brain is an organ, that's an organ. And so. Uh, so, but I'm going to make the final conclusion here, and it's a little faint and um, wordlessly, as is appropriate. We, in fact, I'm going to turn to a brain which is really good, and that would be Dan's brain. And what I've done here after the independent component analysis is assign tones to different regions of the brain. And so this may be a moment if we could dim the lights a little. I don't know, that would be great. And you can listen for a minute or so. He's, this is in the actual time frame of the experiment. It's five minutes, so we'll just get a bit of this and, and, uh, and then finish. Of his, which I'm sure people have have questions about. 
Um, I, first, I guess I would like a little bit, you said a bit, but I, not enough to me about what, what rules you used to, to put the sound to the data uh, for listening to my brain. So if you could say a little bit more about where, what, how you put the sure. tags on, I'd like to know. Thanks. Do you remember my talk? Yeah. <laughs> you can remember what you wanted to ask, but you should really remember what you thought I might reply to that, and then you can tell me that, and then I can tell you that. Um, sonification is an open-ended process of converting uh, streams of data into sound. And so um, what I did with Dan's brain is really kind of sonification 101. Um, I took each, uh, each component and um, had analyzed it. Um, I had 20 components, but actually I removed 10 of them as artifacts, um, leaving me with some fairly recognizable. Yeah, we're all half artifacts. But recognizable uh, regions, I thought. They're, and this is default mode. And so anyway, I had those 10 variables that were varying. And so I took a pentatonic scale and, um, and assigned notes simply on the base, uh, just it's arbitrary in this case. You can use more and more features of the input stream to assign more representative sorts of, uh, of sounds um, using, say, the overtone series. But that's how I did it with this, so. Yeah, yeah that's good. Question? That? Wait, wait for Mike, please. What's that in real time, or was it? That was real time, yes. OK. Yes, Thank slow you. moving. I just mentioned that the, um, the images were captured every, uh, a little bit, about every half second, which is actually quite different from all the other images I worked with. So there's a couple, wherever the mic goes. I, <clears throat> I actually had a, the same question about how you transcribe music <laughs> to count the symbols. What counted as a symbol? Right, that's a good was question. It just Notes. pitches? Yeah, pitches. So it's the pitches. It wasn't the distribution of length of notes in the oh, rhythm. Uh, unfortunately, that I mean that is obviously a variable that should be considered. Yeah. Um, but in this case, it's the sequence of pitches. So basically, there were just uh, twelve pitches that you had to. Uh, no, it's across. It's across the octaves. It's the yeah. Uh, oh well. Absolute. Uh, hmm? Absolute pitch. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, the, these songs went across octaves, so it's more than simply twelve. But anyway. Yeah, I'm more interested not on the, the tone generation itself, but on, on the chart that you had with uh, all the different, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, inputs that you, you like uh, the brain at rest and, 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 and how did you make the correlation between the Zephy distribution to, ma I mean, what parameters did you use to match, to correlate those, two, those completely diff uh, distinct uh, uh, inputs of information? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> there's an ideal Ziffian curve, and it is, uh, uh, you can use Ziff's law to calculate that. And you can do it depending on the length of the string that you want to apply it to. And that gives you a prediction according to the ideal law. And that was what I measured against the actual observation. So I just, I'm uh, taking the um, inputs, uh, I've parsed them out into notes or words or these, or hotspots. Uh, and then I'm counting the frequency of occurrences, and then I'm comparing that curve to the ideal curve. Uh, but you, you got the, the, fr the, the occurrence, but not the frequency, right? I mean, uh, oh, well, yeah, there, it's over that period of time, occurrence and frequency, it, you could get the frequency, but in fact, it's sort of the same <coughs> variable because I'm counting all, all the occurrences over a period of time, just as you'd count all the does in the Wikipedia. It's another kind of measurement to talk about the frequencies from over through this series. Yeah, because uh, you could like do a Fourier transform that could on, vary. On, a, on a frequency itself. OK, let's just That's answer the question. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Another question for me, um, while people are thinking of their questions. Um, the schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, 
you say it might have a practical use. How, um, have you have you been talked about this with uh, uh, clinicians and to see whether or not this might be a, a test that might want to, people might want to use? Um, I have not. I mean, it's an interesting possibility. Are there any clinicians here? Huh. I can I could say a little bit about um, one of the uh, I guess observations or or theories of schizophrenia is a, a global disconnection syndrome. Uh, and the manifestation of that is that the that areas of the brain are oscillating at different frequencies, and that appears then, that's mapped on to the frequencies of sound. But also, musicians can hear rhythmic differences between the two kinds of data that, uh, that are harder to characterize. I mean, you can, the, Hope would be, as is the case with the stethoscope, you couldn't say about the heart before you have trained doctors what it is that they're listening to. They know they're listening to something and they learn over time that what they're listening to is a defective heart valve or something like that. Likewise, it's, you can say statistically the reason the schizophrenia sounds like this is there's some obvious properties of, of frequency, but there might be other things and it's, and it's the question of what we're not asking or asking new questions about uh, about data that are not the obvious or initial questions that you might ask. Marcel. Schizophrenics had this impressive heightened frequency mm -hmm. uh, that you derived, um, and thinking very simply about how schizophrenia differs from a normal calm state, <coughs> it is a matter of arousal. Mm -hmm. Schizophrenics have very high arousal levels, even though you can't see it on their faces. And in catatonia, they are sky high. And um, that has to do with the sympathetic nervous system. That has to do with increased frequency. So I wonder if you made some connection of that kind. I think that's a very interesting possibility. The connection, in, in a general way, is that the regions identified by independent component analysis are really oscillating at higher frequencies. That could be an arousal. Uh, that could be one of the ways in which it, it occurs. Well, a very easy way of checking that mm -hmm. would be okay. to do it twice, which one usually has to do to understand anything. One in the, in the state of running around in whatever space they're permitted, and the other in a very, very calm atmosphere where the voices go away. Which is a, a key point. And uh, if you found that the frequencies go toward the normal distribution, I think that would be a lovely discovery. Generalizing a bit, uh, there's somebody back there, well, but I'll make a point. Well, um, I think, Dan, that we ought to take your, your pioneering effort here much more seriously in one regard, in that using auditory pattern recognition is, is a great way of, of data mining, of listening to data. Uh, I know Rodolfo Linas used to wire up uh, his, his brain patients so that he could listen to what's going on. And, and anybody who's seen uh, um, the uh, firing, heard um, the firing of the uh, mirror neurons in, um, I can't think of his name right now. Um, hmm? Yeah, Rizzolatti, in, in, in Rizzolatti's uh, original uh, films. Uh, but in general, the, uh, there are particularly rhythms uh, and patterns that we can't pick up visually or not well, that just hits you in the face when you turn them into sound. And I wonder if there's other neuroscientists that are simply thinking of putting their data to music in effect so they can find patterns that are, they're blind to. And if there are any in the room, well, let's talk. There was, I don't know if you noticed this, but there was a very interesting structure to the thing at the end, your brain. And I don't suppose that, uh, I don't know how to, 
whether that's the same as in other brains or not, but it really at different levels, different time frames, there was structure there, which I'm not sure discussions of default mode are getting at. Now, I, that's not an area that I'm totally in command of, and others might be, but, but uh, there was something there to be heard. Okay, um, so I had a quick question about, um, we were talking about the schizophrenic brain and you were talking in the normal brain. When you're measuring these frequencies, are you measuring like, per region, is it different? Or is it just, like, are you measuring what is vacillating between? Or are you measuring uh, just per, like? Per region, and that, okay. that frequency per region is what determines the frequency of the tone. Okay, so what, so what regions that you're measuring, oh, like what regions are writing up are also important? Or is it just the frequency, I guess? That's the independent components. Mm -hmm. And so in these experiments, 20 independent components were extracted, and they are the ones whose frequencies are measured. They're, of course, oscillating at very low frequencies. The images are collected every two seconds. That's what's there to be detected. And, um, and they are just bumped up into an audible range. Okay. Uh, that's, that's what we get. Though. More questions? We can. What we're going to do next, then, is we have uh, Steve Finker's talk and discussion, and then there'll be some time for general discussion. Everybody, you can start putting together uh, points from earlier talks. Uh, let me just give you a little preview. At 6 o'clock, it's time for drinks and supper here. And that should give us plenty of time to get refreshed before we go over the top of the hill, almost all of us, I hope, to hear the concert. Uh, Scott Johnson's piece, Mind Out of Matter. Scott, would you stand up, please? This is the composer, and uh, he's done something amazing. Everybody who's heard it, I think, is, thinks this is an amazing piece of music. So uh, uh, I heard it in New York on Tuesday, and I can't wait to hear it again. Although I have to say, some of you may never want to hear my voice again. <laughs> <laughs>